If, uh, if I could have your attention, please. Um, I'm going to inter interrupt your meal a bit. I uh, appreciate the opportunities, the networking. It's uh, fast and furious out in the hallways and uh, as it is here. Um, each year, uh, we uh, give out a couple of awards uh, that we, we uh, hold sort of dear to our hearts. And um, I hope you will share in, in welcoming the recipients of uh, this year's uh, award winners for the M. King Hubbard Awards. The, the, what we've uh, essentially done is we've created awards. Uh, this is for folks in, in North America. Uh, uh, we assume that the Europeans and elsewhere will create their own awards set up. But for folks on, on this side of the pond who um, have shown excellence in energy education, um, and with a specific focus on the peak oil story because it's so challenging. Uh, the question was posed earlier today, what could and should the World Bank do? And one of my answers would be educate, educate, educate your peers. Um, and that's what we are awarding here today. Uh, we cover a broad spectrum uh, of sectors uh, in terms of having our, our, the individuals uh, uh, picked out. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll show you the previous recipients. You can see how broad that, that sector is. Uh, Dr. Al Bartlett, uh, who we, we had hoped would be here with us, um, uh, is an, a physicist and an expert in, in both energy and population. Uh, Dr. Walter Youngquist, um, and he is here, so I would like him to stand, please. One of my favorite human beings in the world. Uh, he, is, he is indefatigable on this. He's working on a second edition of his book, uh, Geodestinies. Uh, Buzz Ivanhoe, who uh, helped Randy and me come up to speed in so many ways back in the 80s and 90s when he was covering this story. Richard Heinberg in the back. I think he's in the back row. Uh, very accomplished author. If, if uh, Al Bartlett is way ahead with 1,600 or so presentations on this story since 1978, uh, Richard Heinberg is a uh, distant second, but he's way out in front of everybody else who's on his heels. He's, he's uh, another indefatigable person. Speaking of, of that word, Congressman Roscoe Bartlett, as, as you know, uh, has made an innumerable presentations on the floor of the House. Uh, and he is uh, extremely active on this subject, the most active uh, elected official. And I've got a couple of, uh, w we have created a new award that we'll, you'll hear about tomorrow on that. Uh, Charlie Maxwell from the financial community. Um, many of you in the financial community have a head start on other sectors, industry, utilities, academia, the general public, and so on. Uh, in part because of folks like Charlie Maxwell and, and also Henry Grappi, uh, who's an oil industry analyst uh, in his 80s who uh, has been uh, speaking about this subject for a long time. So that's, that's our uh, group of award winners in the past, and now let's get to, to this year's. And we're taking a pretty different tack this year. Um, remember, this is the effect, the, the reaching out in, in, in different ways into different sectors. And uh, here is our, uh, our first award winner that we would like to acknowledge this year. Uh, Julian Darley with Global Public Media. They do a very high level educational outreach through this site. Their, their interviews are fascinating in, and uh, countless. I was on the site this morning and you can uh, uh, hear directly the words of so many people around the world thanks to their efforts. And they do uh, more obviously through with Post Carbon, their think tank. Uh, their, their relocalization efforts are uh, impressive. Uh, right up the street from me in Boulder, Colorado, they uh, do uh, uh, it's, an, it's an impressive group there. They are a, a leading proponent of intelligent responses to the problem. We've seen a lot of 
proposed what I would say less than intelligent responses, that's not the case with global public medias and the Post Carbon Institute. And indeed, the, the uh, stable of speakers and, and folks who can offer information from their shop is truly impressive. So please welcome uh, Julian Darley and the Global Public Media is this year's winner. Magnificent edifice. Thank you. Um, I have some um, very brief prepared remarks. Um, first, thank you. It is a tremendous honor. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be in the company of the people that Steve has outlined. And it's always nice, as I'm sure, for all of you out there um, to be recognized. And uh, I would just like to say that um, Global Public Media was started seven years ago. Uh, in response to some difficulties in the media about talking about serious issues. Those serious issues haven't gone away. Post Carbon Institute was started five years ago in direct response to the peak oil uh, issue. And ever since then, we, along with so many of you uh, out there, um, have been working more or less day and night ever since to, uh, um, to try and make better known this um, problem and issues of peak oil and energy depletion. Um, it is becoming apparent to many of us, um, even beyond these walls, that we cannot drill our way out of this. And to quote Dave Hughes, um, the only thing we can do, I think, um, that's best going to work is to think our way out of this. We need to think about how to shorten our supply chains, and there is increasing talk of this in uh, many uh, quarters, including here. Um, I think regarding thinking our way out of this, there's a ray of light, because there's some evidence from history that we can be quite good at this. We must use our powers of thought to reach the mainstream and the movers. And we must scale up our efforts in order to do this. I think we all know this. And I would say, the more we can do this together, the more we can think together, the better. So thank you, ASPO. Thank you for bringing us together so that we can think all the harder. And thank you so much for this award. Thank you. Julian's one of the folks who's lucky in the sense that he doesn't have a peak oil widow. Um, his, his wife is very much involved with this story. A, a, a lot of us, either husbands or the spouse, is, is long-suffering. Uh, I'm looking at some board members nodding. Uh, Julian's lucky that his, his partner in life is equally committed to this task. Um, our next award is, is somewhat similar in, in the vein. Uh, this isn't an individual. Um, this is uh, an extraordinary group of, of people online, a community that, frankly, there are probably more of them here at one time than there are anywhere else at one time. Uh, and they've done a, a great deal uh, to assist us in, in slowly over the last three years in um, sharing their viewpoints with you in presentations at this conference. If you went to the oil track, uh, oil drum track uh, yesterday afternoon, I'm sure you learned a lot of uh, the latest and the greatest. Uh, uh, Kyle Saunders, uh, who will accept on behalf of this team, and it, and it is indeed a, a, an impressive team, they seem to come up with a, a, an endless stream of uh, critical thinking and original analysis that gets posted really quickly uh, in, in some cases and, and with some good deliberation uh, in others that, that you didn't see it coming and, and you go, wow, that's, that's pretty... That's pretty informative stuff. Uh, that's breaking new ground. Um, and, and they're sort of, I view them as a whack-a-mole team, too. You, you, you can't knock them down, and if one of them goes offline, another one comes on, and before you know it, it's, it's sort of like the Verizon team. You know, look, look at all these people behind me backing me up. That's what the oil, oil drum uh, indeed is. Uh, so, and we, we really uh, appreciate the, the enormous traffic that they've attracted, and r rightfully. So, uh, Kyle, if you want to come up uh, and accept the award, we're, we're very glad to uh, provide that to you this year, the, to the oil drum. Thank you so much. It is beautiful. It really is. Um, I have a couple of remarks as well. Uh, 
the, excuse me while I get them out here. This is quite an honor. Um, first off, I would like to ask for a round of applause to, to Steve and the many, many folks at ASPO who have made this happen. It, they, you, seriously. This is an amazing event. Um, thank you. We accept the M. King Hubbard Award for our contributors, our readers, and the pink oil community who continue to engage in the ongoing battle for the attention of the American and world public. We accept this award for the peak oil community writ large. On behalf of ASPO USA, Energy Bulletin, Global Public Media, peakoil.com, and the many other leaders of this movement who are with us at this esteemed meeting, all fighting the good fight in many different ways, all thinking hard about the complicated uncertainties we will have to face in our energy future. When we started the oil drum over three years ago, David Summers, the venerable heading out on TOD, who is right back there, and I wanted to learn more about our energy future. We had no idea what kind of adventure our research and learning would take us on. It boggles the mind, the daunting gravity and complexity of these problems. The attitude we try to promote at TOD is clinical and empirical, with a graceful amount of concern for humanity thrown in for flavor. It is academic, it is educated, it is critical, and it is certainly not for everyone. And it is also not easy. Not easy without the commitment of many good people. It is rewarded many with insight and the comfort of community while dealing with a topic that gives many fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And in that spirit, our mission remains. Educate, educate, educate. That is why we do what we do. Our volunteer staff does this for that exact reason, because we see the urgency of the situation. We wanted to create a, a space where we could address the complicated narratives of energy with the idea that the more informed and diverse dialogues we could have about those problems, as well as the many proposed solutions to those problems, the better off we would be as a society. Every single person we educate about our energy solution, our situation is another person who has the choice to learn more, prepare according to their own perceptions, and educate others. We've had the opportunity to work with some of the brightest and most wonderful people I've ever had the opportunity of meeting and I'd like to introduce to them to you briefly. Uh, I mentioned Dave Summers earlier. Please stand up as I call your name. Please hold your applause till the end. Um, Gail Verberg, you know her as Gail the Actuary. Uh, she's also she's stepped into a greater role lately. Robert Rapier, with his incisive insights into ethanol, biofuels, and energy writ large. Jeff Vale, with his educational discourses on the complex geopolitical lay of the land, back there as well and Brian Mashoff with his Google Earth analyses of Saudi Arabia are quite wonderful. He's back there as well. We're also missing Nate Hagens, who couldn't join us, as well as you and Mirans. We, we, we miss them terribly and wish they could be here with us. To close, we think King Hubbard would know what we mean when we say that we accept this award in the spirit of research, in the spirit of education, in the spirit of community, and the spirit of brotherhood, all of which can give us the courage to face the many uncertainties of our energy future. Thank you very much. Uh, one last award. Um, Tom Whipple, we've named this award after him because he would dominate the award every year for as, as a uh, for all the work that he does for ASPO USA. It's, if you woke up this morning at 6.30 and you flipped open your computer, there it was, the Peak Oil News. If you uh, looked and it, it was also the Peak Oil Review was there. Uh, he's at this conference and yet that stuff keeps showing up whether he's in Italy or Canada or where, wherever. So we've named the award in his honor. Um, this year's a winner. Uh, first we want to 
sort of acknowledge all the people with UC Davis, all the blue shirts. I think most of them aren't in the room, but they've done a great job of, of uh, helping us out. <laughs> Their boss is the guy we'd like to award here. He's, he's really a true key to this conference. Anything from the mechanics to the content, uh, he moderated with a, a deft touch uh, and, and great entertainment value as well. The uh, reporting on the peak oil story yesterday. Uh, please welcome John Theobald as our Whipple Award winner. test of impromptu speaking, I guess. I, I, I don't think a week goes by that I don't think about the, the Denver conference in 2005. And uh, walking in that room, I, I think the only name I knew in Denver was John Elway. And <laughs> probably a probably hundred people that were there and since that I email with on, on a constant basis. Uh, I went to school in West LA and you get used to seeing celebrities walk by all the time and, and it's not that big of a deal and I remember going to that conference like, my god that's Matt Simmons over there um, Henry Grappi all these these names uh, it has been it it hasn't been work it's just been a pleasure working with these folks this year and for those of you that are attending for the first time I hope you have the same experience as I did to have at the accessibility of the people here and the quality of, of the people here. For a guy that teaches communication and media classes, uh, the learning curve is just like that, and it's because of everyone in this room. And especially thanks to all the, the people you see running around here in blue shirts. They are really making this whole thing work smooth. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. And you could have mentioned Jeremy Gilbert as one of those who, who uh, yeah. the segue now is, is Jeremy Gilbert is one of those who is both at Denver, is, is with us every year, and he's now here to introduce our lunchtime speaker, Jeremy. Well, it's uh, a pleasure, and I guess it's also an honor, to, um, to introduce Jim Bucky. Um, Jim is someone who I think is very valuable to, to the, the peak oil movement and to, to ASPO because he's one of the few people who's actually spent time in the industry and knows something about the way in which oil fields behave or don't behave. So he's someone who needs to be listened to and uh, is worth listening to. He's um, a physicist by background. He has a degree in physics from the University of Western Australia and then he went on to get a PhD in astrophysics at, at Oxford. Uh, I first met Jim in the early 1980s when we were both with BP in the UK. Jim was a, uh, a formidable adversary I would say on some occasions but uh, on other occasions he was a good guy to be around. He went on from BP to um, take what had been a BP subsidiary and turn it into a major independent oil company. He was chief executive officer of, of Talisman um, for about 15 years, uh, turned it into a, a very significant international operator and when he retired uh, just about a year ago, he um, became uh, openly interested in, in peak oil. So now he's here to tell us, I'm not sure what the title of his talk is to be honest, but uh, He's here to give us an insider's view of, uh, of how the oil industry works and its impact on peak oil. Jim. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerry, for that um, kind introduction. We did indeed cross swords here and there within BP, but uh, basically we're good friends. I, I also I want to thank ASPO for this opportunity to talk to this crowd. 
I'm an avid reader of the oil drum and have been for a long time, so I want to thank uh, those people for their uh, excellent work. I sometimes, uh, of course I couldn't when I was uh, working at Talisman, but I sometimes have subsequently given a talk that I call Ye Old Tank and Spigot. And uh, this, this is to sort of uh, a, allude to British pubs, but it's supposed to draw attention to the canonical variables of volume and rate. And a lot of people, a lot of this discussion gets confused on volume and rate. Um, so Steve asked me to talk from an industry perspective and I've, um, and the industry going forward, and, and, I, and I will do. Um, but I, I got a few other little bits of um, uh, reasons why I believe that uh, peak oil is real, and uh, I've, a lot of the um, elements of the story are common to everybody, and, and I understand what they're saying. Uh, on my presentation at the bottom left, it's a disclaimer, because I was a CEO, you have to say, don't, you know, don't believe anything I'm going to say. So uh, the d d disclaimer is still there. I use public data. A lot of the data that we have that Jerry uses and various other people are sort of uh, passed around so they're common to all. So if anybody's not attributed, that, well, I'm very sorry. So I want to start out with a, a thing that hasn't really been addressed, to my knowledge so far, is the extreme field size distribution in the world uh, of in, on the basis of reserves. So. Uh, I don't have a staff working for me, so the slides are a bit clunky. But anyway, it, it, this is an index set of the world oil field sizes. And you can see three fields dominate. And we all know what, what, you know, what those fields are. Um, but it's not only that. You, by the time you get to 40, 50, you know, you've run out of things that are going to make any difference. So when you look at volume by field size, those first uh, fields greater than uh, 50 billion barrels, uh, of which there are two, contribute there, uh, Bergan and Gawa, there's their 100 and so. The five to 50 billion barrels, the major contributor, half a billion to five is very important. But then you get to point one to point five, so fundamentally anything below 100 million barrels doesn't really count. And the, po the point about this is that's about uh, 1,300 fields, and we know what they are. You can look at them. You can count them, and, and lots of people um, do, as, as, as did um, Peter last night. So here are the largest fields. I hope you can see those. So there's Gawa, Bagan, Cantorell. And uh, as uh, you come down, I'm going to talk a little bit about Samet Laws, number 12, Prudhoe Bay, 13, Abcake. 14. I've uh, also starred, although the, some of the stars seem to have slipped, uh, all of those that are in the Middle East and uh, are within the Gulf, let alone the Middle East. So this, this shows the massive dominance of the, the Gulf in this story. The other thing you can probably tell is of the ones I've highlighted, they go in decline, in decline, in decline, in decline, in decline, question mark. And the, the question mark over Gawa is, is indeed very important. To put just another way of looking at the extreme field size distribution, the 97% uh, of the world's known reserves is in 10% of the fields. And as I say, we know where they are and we know what they're doing <laughs> within limits. I, I take Matt Simmons' point that the data is pretty obscure and they don't tell you, but in principle you could know it. So my, my next point is to look at the... Uh, mechanics of oil fields and they all decline. So uh, that's not very clear, but um, what, what I'm trying to do there is show that a straight line against of rate versus cumulative production is the same as exponential declines. Very simple mathematical transformation, but I'm saying all fields go into exponential decline. The way to look at, one way to look at it is to look at straight line versus cum. And I think Jerry probably used the same slide. Anyway, uh, here we have uh, some very famous fields. Samatlor, uh, 10th big, it's a Russian field. It's the basis for uh, BPTNK. It's in, you know, terminal decline and it's almost over. 40s, terminal decline, almost over. 
East Texas, Wilmington, we've already talked about Prudhoe Bay, biggest fields, onshore US, terminal decline. Now, uh, here are some ones I know in particular. Uh, Fulma, these, these are big, big fields. 800 million barrels stoep, which is stock tank oil originally in place. Um, Beatrice, uh, 400 million barrels, Clyde 500, which farm, and they all do exactly the same, Whoom. exponential decline. So I've looked at uh, perhaps 30 or 40 fields, uh, or big fields now, to try and get some average behavior, and I see Jerry uses it, uh, has come to the same sort of conclusion. So on average, rough average, oil fields decline after 50% of reserves are produced and they decline at circa 10% per annum. And on average, good fields will recover 50% of uh, original oil in place, you know, given time and care and attention. But these numbers de depend on a couple of things. Uh, basically, reservoir complexity, so that a very good field, you get piston-like displacement, it's on plateau for a long time, then bang, it's all over. More complicated fields come off plateau, but they decline more slowly also depends on facility constraints, because water handling and gas handling. So when you look at what's going on in the Middle East, you've got to look at a number of rigs is one thing, but the, the amount of um, eight-foot diameter water pipes that are being taken into Gawa. Anyway, of, uh, my main point about all these fields is they, sooner or later, they all decline. And the importance of this, so when you've got a suite of fields, you don't get the exponential decline, you get slightly different sort of decline. But anyway, the discussion has been over whether the world's declining at 5%, 7%, maybe 8%, um, whereas the, uh, and some say 10, whereas the latent demand growth is 1.5% per annum. So the, if these numbers are any way close to true, we need to, in 10 years' time, replace 50 to 60 million barrels a day, six Saudi Arabias. So volume is one thing, rate is another. There is no, well, in my, in this, in, let's leave the conclusion for a moment, but it seems very unlikely. So let's look at Saudi Arabia for a minute. And uh, what I've drawn on here is Saudi and the Gulf in general. I've, I've uh, bothered to try and pick out the, the biggest fields to show what an amazing place this is. These are of that um, list that I showed first of 20 biggest fields. Well, gosh, here they all are. There's Gawa, Bergan, Berry, Karais, uh, Safanir, Gassaran, Awaz, Maroon, Kirkuk. All, all in that tiny little space. And then just for completeness, there's the, the North Field as well, which is 900 plus TCF on the Gattery side and it go, becomes South Paths that goes into uh, Iran. This is an amazing uh, concentration of fields. It's the old Tethys Sea. So now I want to look at the, the, the uh, touchstone here, uh, which is Gawar itself. And um, I pointed to a number of things here. The first is Abcake, right? Abcake is a, it's a look-alike for the northern parts of uh, Gawa, Eindar, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Eindar, which is in the north, and, and uh, Harad, which is in the south. I've also, with the red arrow, pointed up the scale here. So that is 0 to 10 miles. This field is 174 miles by... 15 or 16 miles. It's enormous. I also want to make a, a, a point sometime that exploration in Saudi, and for that matter, uh, west of Iraq, is, is a, uh, fairly fruitless. It's very, very simple geology. It's very layer cake. There are no hidden surprises. And a lot of extensive exploration has come up with nothing over a long time. So. Um, we, as Talisman, didn't go into Saudi when the gas rounds on because we didn't think we'd find any. So let's uh, look at Ab Cake. Well, guess what? It shows exponential decline just like any other field. And um, it starts on, as you can see there, 1998, uh, on exponential decline, ignoring the first bit, 
uh, at about 60% of expected ultimate recovery. And then the, the purple, which is other fields, is, is fine, but doesn't offset the uh, decline. So now I want to do a little bit of very simplified reservoir geology. Um, and basically, this is the depositional environment for Gawa, and I borrowed this from somewhere, uh, a, a paper in the internet. And without going into it too much, yellow is good, as you can see, and the gray-blue is bad. So you can see on uh, Abcake is good, northern part of Gawa is good, southern half, maybe more, is bad. And, and uh, just uh, to show, uh, this in fact, um, it, it's, it's uh, a, a coarsening upward sequence, so it's better at the top, but there's a lot of vertical fractures in it, so it's actually a, a wonderful reservoir, so bad is comparative. So to, to take that forward, uh, here's some cross sections. The middle is good. Now that looks like just a pile of beads. That's got high permeability, high porosity. Top left is the mudstone, that's bad. If there's oil in there, it's gonna stay there. Right, so, right. Gawa's 174 miles by 16, it's huge, and it's stock tank oil in place, 190 billion barrels. And uh, this is an extremely good number, because uh, I, I know people who worked on that, and so that's a good number. They've assumed 60% recovery factor. Um, but that seems to me it's okay in the north, but not in the south. But uh, have a look at the, the quality here. This is for, for the specialists. The, the PI, I, the rate per well, is 140 uh, barrels per day per PSI. So you draw them down 100 PSI and you've got 14,000 barrels a day. But how in the south is still, you know, respectable. So let's say reserves are 80 to 90 uh, billion barrels, and it is producing 5 million barrels a day, 8 BCF per day. So Cumulative production is 53 billion barrels, 28% of stoic, or 59 to 66 on uh, expected ultimate recoverable reserves. So if this field isn't on decline, it's right there. We've already talked about Cantorell. I've, uh, that's the um, Pemex's forecast, and I've just put some crosses on the, uh, some updated it a bit, and yes, it is on decline. And I'd um, flesh that out by talking. I've also talked to Saad al Husseini. He, he's an extremely good guy. And he says, natural declines in existing capacity are real. Um, getting to 12 million barrels a day for, for Saudi would wreak havoc within a decade. Chairman uh, Farouk al Zanki of Bergan says it, it's peaked and it's going down. It, it was supposed to be producing 2 million barrels a day. It's at 1.7. We elsewhere have noticed that Kuwait, this is uh, Kuwait on the BP reserves has got 100 million barrels. Their own internal is 50. So this is uh, a subject of another talk. But a lot of those uh, BP reserves are, let's to be kind and say they're unexamined. <coughs> so uh, I, I think in practice they just report what the government tells them. Um, so Daqing is, um, says they're in 3% decline. We've already talked about Cantrell and Samatlaw and my point, given the extreme field size distribution, is if the big fields are in trouble, the world's in trouble. And point that uh, the oil drums made a number of times, exports decline faster than production. And I'll return to that. So I, I also want to look at, um, just briefly, at alternatives. And in the, as in the tank and spigot, there's a question of rate versus volume. So here's um, uh, NGL, NGLs, gas plant liquids. And you can see, well, it's come up very, very strongly. I forget who's project. This is EIA projection. It's come up very strongly in the last few years and has supported the illusion that the, well, it's not an illusion, world liquids production has increased. But you strip out, as Matt was saying, you strip out the uh, NGLs and other liquids and look at black oil only, and black oil only has peaked in September 05. But anyway, if you look at the left-hand side here, this is, nine, max is 9 million barrels a day starts to climb. 
and we've, we've got most of that already. So there's not much salvation in the future uh, coming from this, and a lot of this is the Gattery Northfields doing LNG. This is uh, XTL, anything to liquids. So coal, gas, fuel. <laughs> Right. And it's, it's on the chart there, it goes out to September 12th, and it goes up to 2.5 million barrels a day. So maybe it's good or not, and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm with the other speakers who said this, the energy return is, is useless. And I, I take the point on um, Barnett Shales too, and, and that's the very best, the others are worse. <coughs> um, anyway, so this is X XDL is a minor contributor. So, so this is my main point here. Um, if conventional black oil reserves are something like 750 to 1,000 billion barrels, say, um, the, the decline rate of this in the 5 to 7 range, percent range is 50 to 60 million barrels a day over 10 years. Now, let's look at what else we can do. Increased NGLs. Well, maybe, let's say, be kind, five, although the chart only had one or two. Uh, U.S. probables. So the uh, USGS was big on probables, but let's say it's 20 billion barrels. Let, let be kind in 10 years, that's 2 million barrels a day. Yet to find 50 to 100 billion, 4 million barrels a day within this period. Uh, EOR, uh, maybe, it's a point Jerry made, you can, maybe you can increase reserves a little bit, but the rate is very, very slow. So another four million maybe. Bitumen, extra heavy. So here basically it's uh, Orinoco and Canada. Canada, uh, you know, will max around three million barrels a day. Um, and, and the big question mark, so that 175 billion barrels reserve in Canada, you know, I wouldn't bet anything very much on that. But anyway, let's, let's say it uh, gets to 3 million barrels a day. It doesn't matter when you compare it with the uh, declines. So this is a point that uh, Steve asked me to share my thoughts on. Why are majors so quiet on peak oil? What do they know that we don't know? Well, here's, here's my view, both from inside um, a major, uh, two, and um, um, in, in a small, you know, an independent ENP. In the big companies, by the time, if you're big enough to be Shell, Exxon, BP, you have lots of people thinking on this, and they're economists. And the economists think, if the price of oil goes up enough, God will put some more oil in the ground. This is not true. I've, I've found that. <clears throat> okay, so um, another, all economists will tell you, uh, commodities always go down. Uh, in price, uh, ingenuity overcomes scarcity, but uh, you know, doesn't go to the explorers who tell well, if it's all, if it's so much of it, why don't you tell me where it is? But they never do. Okay, the, the other thing is, uh, be, you know, don't predict uh, event and time at the, at the same time. And the Club of Rome, uh, Malthus, and so on have, have been spectacularly wrong, and this is sort of uh, ridiculed this, this sort of scarcity projection. But oil, you can't recycle uh, oil, you can't reproduce it, you burn it. So it's, it's different. Another thing the oil companies say is, there's plenty of it if we could get at it. Um, first of all, it, it, it implies that the people who already got it are useless, um, so, you know, which is not necessarily true. And it's still got the volume versus rate there. So, so as we saw, there was some EOR in some of those uh, fields I showed you. It, it doesn't really make a difference to rate, even though the volume may. And then uh, the oil companies got heavily bitten. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you this for a minute. This, this is EIA, um, future price projections year by year by year. And I mean, how wrong can you be? So in, in response to that, uh, sensible uh, leaders of the majors say low-cost producer wins. I don't know what the price is, I can't tell, but I'm going to be low-cost producer and so I'm going to win every time. And so that's why you've got all the majors saying we test all our projects at 16, 18. I know for sure that's not true because we did projects with them, but it's what they said. And by the time you got to the Middle East, of course, they said, well, Exxon says it's going to be $18, so why should we build some, uh, do some more investment? And I, I, up and down the Gulf, I met that a lot of times. There are some t uh, signs of change. 
<coughs> in this, and we now hear, oh, one other little point I want to make. If, if the leader of Exxon stands up and says, listen, guys, game's over, I, I think the political outfall of that is, is going to be so big that you know, maybe they're just being very careful. I don't know. Um, I think there are signs of change, and that's morphed a little bit into, well, cheap oil's over. Um, <coughs> if, you look at the, if you look at the replacement, oil replacement rates and F&D, finding development costs for the majors, it's appalling. And their replacement's been a lot less than 100%, and, and a, a lot of it's been gas too, particularly Exxon. So it's been replacing, it says we've 100% reserve replacement, but the, all of that's Middle East gas. Uh, black oil replacement is very low. So I think we've covered the point of uh, predicting oil prices uh, very difficult. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the industry now. Uh, expiration is tough, F&D is rising. That's all companies everywhere. And um, particularly, you know, Chevron, Exxon, and so on, have zooming uh, F&D. The uh, people have made this point, industry is extremely tight. You can't get people, the demographics, people are, uh, you know, 55 coming off the edge. Um, so you can't get services, you can't get equipment, lead times for compressors have doubled. Uh, costs have uh, increased dr dramatically, doubled in the past three or four years, and, and more again. Um, who was saying in the seismic, right? They're, they're, they're factors of three. You were saying, I think, this morning. Um, and then the other thing is the industry fights declines every day. Uh, and that's coupled with the next, which is really profound. There is no opposite of a train wreck. Uh, every, t every time you wake up in the morning, something will have gone wrong. There'll be a leak, this corrosion, as somebody uh, mentioned earlier. You know, something's blown up. Some there's no, suddenly it's gone better than it was before, right? It doesn't happen. It's, so it, train wrecks do. And then this, this, so I move now on to what I, I'm supposed to be talking about, which is resource nationalism is rampant. Um, so, um, first of all, host governments want sovereignty and control, um, not just tax collection. So there's a, a, a big element here, and this is a quote from James Plack, I think, who was U.S. ambassador, Middle East, about the 70s. And they want a rebalancing of power and status with the West, which we can recognize that. Um, mineral resources deplete, and there's a finite pie to cut up. So they think, well, if, if this is going down, we want the most of it. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And this uh, resource nationalism is not limited to OPEC. Scotland, it's Scotland's oil. Alberta Royalty Review just recently. Uh, Kuwait, Venezuela, Russia, Russia, special petroleum tax in the UK, windfall profits tax in the US, um, everybody does it. But, and this is what uh, I have said to lots of regulators, oil in the ground's worth nothing. So if you squeeze us off totally, you get no we get nothing, you get nothing. And so the government should, you would think, uh, maximize present value by encouraging activity. That's certainly the industry view and things we would say to, e.g., the Alberta government. And uh, I'll come back to that, but I just want to back off a little bit um, and talk about how PSCs work, because it's quite relevant. So um, in a PSC, you get um, this, these bricks here are supposed to represent you know, the first few years of uh, oil production and uh, the revenue generated by it. Uh, from this revenue, operating costs are always uh, come off the bottom. Then uh, the industry gets capital cost recovery from a share of the revenue stream. And that's, I put that as blue here. And then what's left, the so-called profit oil, gets split between the government and the company. And the company might, on average, sort of gets around 30% of profit oil. There's lots of variance and complexities, but that's how it works in principle. Then when the capital uh, is recovered, then you know, that cost recovery bit falls away and the, the revenue stream is now split 70-30, company and the government. So if you have a PSC where cost recovery is 40% of the total stream, they put a cap on that, then when there's a cost overrun, 
it delays pain a little bit, but so what? When the uh, governments were very, very weak, a lot of governments negotiated 100% cost recovery. And you can, st you can still get that uh, in India, for example, I think. And so what, happens, so what happens here now, you get, or the company gets, capital recovery up front, 100%, and then when the capital's recovered, you split 70-30 with the government. It looks like that. But here what happens is that a, an overrun uh, comes directly, well, it comes directly out of the government hide anyway, but um, it defer, they get no uh, cost recovery until, they get no revenue until the costs are all recovered. And this is what went wrong at Sakhalin. This was a lousy, for the gov uh, Russian government, it was a lousy agreement. And so when they said, that, you know, these, we're not allowing these cost overruns and so on, we've got to renegotiate, this is why. Okay, so um, I, I want to uh, look at who gets what out of production. PSCs is one. So the top lot are royalty tax and the bottom lot uh, are PSCs. And um, you, you can see that in um, the, the top three tend to be high cost environments too, but you can see a company take of 40, low in Norway, but 23, 24, 25% um, of the total pie. In the um, low ones of PSC, this, uh, the companies still get in the sort of 20, 25% but governments get uh, a whole lot more. And this is at about, this is at $64 a barrel. So that's production. You can argue whether this is fair or not. But now let's look at when we get to gasoline. On the, the left two is uh, US, the situation in the US. And it's for uh, uh, oil at $24 and $120 a barrel. In the US, at $24, the US government, the red bar, was getting more from a barrel of oil than the host government, and this annoyed them a lot. Uh, when it went up to 120, the, the US uh, kept the same uh, tax, 44 cents or so, and so a lot of the uh, increased revenue flowed back to the host government, and they were happy. When you look at the UK, um, the government there, at, at $24 a barrel, the, the government gets nearly three quarters, massively more than the, the owner of the resource. When you get to $120, the uh, host government's gone up again, but still the, the huge winner is the UK government. And I know because I've talked to a lot of people, uh, senior people in the oil companies in the Middle East, they hate this. They have said, we'll give you oil for nothing if we could have the tax. And of course, in, and they never get, nobody takes them on. <coughs> right, so, um, Another aspect here, the international oil company motivation is to grow production, reserves, earnings, share price. But the host government uh, motivation is much more complex. So how much money is enough? So we know, we know an empty purse is bad, but in high prices, other factors come into play. Uh, do they have mechanisms to spend the money? And in the case, for example, in Algeria, the answer is no. And so Khalil, um, talked to him, you know, we're going to do all these things for you. And he said, what for? I don't need it. Right. Um, do they have mechanisms? No. What are we going to do with all these petrodollars that are, that are losing value? And, and you can see them recycled. And then the other thing is, they do believe this. What about the grandchildren? So they produce their fields at 2.5% per annum, 40-year R to P, and that's two generations. And then, of course, there are people who use oil as a weapon. There's the Russians, Venezuela, Bolivia, etc. Now, looking at the terms, I've, I've, this is uh, various commodities over time. The top one is the oil basket. And you've seen it's gone up five and a half fold. Russian gas has gone up three and a half fold. And other things have gone up, but, you know, relatively modest. So my the point I'm trying to make here is in order to look at the resource nationalism and the terms, depend, you've got to look at the, their current account balance. And here I've got uh, the current account balance for, you know, notably India, but also Indonesia, Mexico, Sudan, et cetera, et cetera. They're all zero-ish, and if you look where $20 billion is, it's, it's very, very small. So these guys are still struggling. 
So needless to say, you can get really good terms in Vietnam, Sudan, Mexico is different, they won't let you in, uh, Indonesia, India, best terms uh, available, etc. But look at these people, right? right at the top is Saudi's current account, look where $20 billion is, the, the current account balance for uh, Saudi and Russia now is in the hundreds of billions of dollar, dollars and uh, Algeria, Iran, Libya and Qatar, uh, guess what, you can't get in anymore. <coughs> so this is just another representation of the same thing. These are changes in government take, 02 to 06, all of a sudden. Uh, the, the countries at the bottom have shut the door on the industry and said, keep out, we don't want you. And they've done that by making the terms very, very tough. As you can see, uh, a lot of those oily places are in 90% plus. But guess what? The, the industry commits suicide all by itself. So th these, th these are bids made in Libya EPSA 4. And in these bids, the, um, you bid the amount of oil that goes into the PSC. So when you, when you, from the amount that goes into the PSC, you've got to re recover your operating costs, capital costs, and share it with the government. So the top bit goes straight to Gaddafi. And uh, you can see that sensible people, will say the majors, said, okay, Gaddafi can have 65% and we'll divvy up the 35% in the PSC, but what happened, that as you came along, the, the up to 15 different companies bid, and the smaller and smaller and smaller companies bid more and more and more, more marginal uh, things so that they got into the action. And this is a measure of how tight uh, access is. So a lot of these things here, they had 13% of the revenue going for, they'll never recover cost, let alone profit. Oxy was a number of these too, but Oxy had uh, other motivations, which you have to ask them about. So uh, another aspect at the mo moment um, is the rise of the NOCs, and this is a long history. So the nationalized assets of uh, these com uh, countries uh, were either forced or by contract expiry. So the first thing was Libya took 55% from Oxy, and that's their special circumstance. Then the Shah took 55% from Anglo-Persian. Um, then Gulf states were offered 55%. Uh, and um, <coughs> I have to say that my, my, you'd have to ask Jerry about this because when the uh, Anglo-Persian was, was kicked out of Iran, they thought they'd got everybody out, but they said, where's Jerry? And Jerry was still in there and everybody else had gone. So you have, have to ask him about that later. Um, anyway, then Venezuela up the ante, uh, you know, KPC uh, took over Gulf Oil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but now they all have preferred, if not exclusive, access to resource. So, um, so what's, the, what's the outcome of this? And if you look at the oil company ranking by reserves, and you the, look from the left, so yellow is gas and red is oil. Uh, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Ghana, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, PDVSA, Nigeria, Libya. You have to go a long, long way down until you get the blue bars, uh, which is Exxon and BP and so on. So in the scheme of things, majors are minor. The, the, only, the only thing I'd say is reserve definitions are very fluid, as we discussed before. So absolute numbers. Um, probably not very reliable, <coughs> or at least they are in terms, the major numbers will be uh, reliable, but they'll be P1, and then there, there is a P2, and maybe there's a P3. So another thing that is uh, changing the shape of the world at the moment is the role of the International National Oil Company. So we, we've had uh, Kufpec, Petronas, Statoil, Sonatrach, Yukos, and now luckily we see BP, TNK, uh, quitting their home turf and they want to compete in the international state. Why do they want to do this? And it's not very clear at all. When, say BPTNK, you've got all of Russia to, as, as your sandpit, why ever would you want to go and fight in somewhere else? Um, so a, a weak rationale is benchmarking. We'll see how we do compared to everybody else. Chest thumping, we're an international oil company, look at us. Um, so I, I, you'd have to ask them about that too, but 
<coughs> there is another competitor now, ONGC, the Indian, CMPC, Chinese, Sinopec, Sinoc, etc. And these are really tough competition because they go in, they compete for access. So the national oil companies get preferred access. Then along comes CMPC and they say, will you let us uh, into exploring your land? We'll build you a bridge and you want some planes, uh, anything you want. And um, they do and it's becoming increasingly, increasingly difficult, particularly in Africa, to get in with um, these people competing. However, NOCs have, uh, this national oil companies have problems. As, as somebody pointed out, there's, um, um, th there's a difference between national oil company and the government. He called it state and nation. Um, but the, the government <coughs> uses the NOC as a piggy bank. And you can see this um, in, very clearly in Pemex, in Mexico, and Petronas in Malaysia. And that means that the company often is starved of reinvestment. Upper echelons in the NOCs are often chosen other than by merit. And uh, I've seen that happen in lots of places. I I'm led to believe that Saudi Aramco is quite meritocratic, believe it or not, but that, that, <coughs> that doesn't answer for the government, of course. There's a lot of just basic corruption. Money disappears. Uh, they're contracting and uh, the sourcing of material is being kind, suboptimal. And then over time, the NOCs reflect the national culture. So some, some, as somebody else said, when the majors were in Saudi, they, they, they taught all the nationals. Um, then they, they went, and then you had people taught by the nationals bringing in the new lot. But eventually, you had people who'd never been, had no outside exposure. So then the national culture goes on. And th th these are things like deference, can't say no, promotion by age, bad news messenger gets shot, and, and I think that applies uh, while these gnomic expressions from Saudi and Venezuela and so on, nobody knows because the story doesn't get up. Anyway, the real problem from the NOC is they're inefficient. At uh, a period, the IOC gets three times as much dollars per barrel than an NOC. However, there are also big stresses on uh, exporters, population growth, and you can't really make that out because uh, anyway, these uh, Nigeria, Sudan, uh, etc., had a 20 plus percent population growth between 2000 and 2006. I mean, this is staggering stuff. Um, their food price has gone up by a factor of two, and they all subsidize gasoline, kerosene, health, education. So, subsidizing um, gasoline and kerosene and so on means demand goes up, and that's where you get the coupled with the population growth, that's where you get the exports declining faster than production. But all of these place huge stresses on uh, governments, and I think in Indonesia, last time I looked, their subsidies was something like 30% of the uh, state budget. Okay, so, <coughs> um, so what do the poor old IOCs do? Uh, they're getting squeezed, there are no, no more concessions, NOCs, INOCs get priority access, Technology is available to everybody. They can all get Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, Geo Services, Brown and Root, ECL, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the Chinese coming up fast. They lend me a pump and I'll give you three that look very similar. And, th and they do that very, very quickly. However, the only future here is NOCs provide uh, more certainty. IOCs, beg your pardon. IOCs provide more certainty for complex project. You can always blame Shell or blame uh, Exxon. IOCs would argue they're aligned with the host government as, as, as the service companies are not. And a very, very important point is that not all host governments want neo-colonialization. They don't want to be, um, you know, dominated by e.g. the Chinese. So uh, it's a difficult time for the IOC uh, and it's a Darwinian struggle. And I think the majors have it uh, probably tougher than smaller companies because of historical baggage. So just, right, I'm just gonna, my last slide here is that <coughs> uh, to point out one of the, pr another major problem for all oil companies trying to get access. And uh, all of this goes to the point that um, you can't, efficient exploitation of uh, reserves is quite a long way off. 
Oil companies are valued by booked reserves. So to book reserves, you've got to have ownership. Host governments don't, don't want to give them ownership. And this has stalled things in Kuwait, Mexico, Iran, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oil companies hate fee-for-service, and so they're gridlocked. Okay, so finally, um, I've got my own version of this that uh, Jerry said everybody has, so I've got mine. And um, <clears throat> the, if you look at the right-hand chart, there's Colin Campbell's discoveries. So my, my own twist on this is as follows. Uh, I've um, put two uh, log normal curves on the discovery, the pale blue one and the red one, and they have uh, 1.9 and 2.4 trillion barrels ultimate black oil. Uh, and then the difference between those is a sudden increase in exploration success post 2005 of 500 billion barrels, which you might doubt, but anyway. So my, the next point I'm trying to make is the yellow so how do you consume this? Obviously, you can't consume more than you've got, right? So in my mind, you consume it either in the yellow curve or the, the bigger volume you consume in the pink curve. So this is a you know, fairly Gaussian sort of uh, symmetrical curve. And to me, this is true. Uh, we'll get to 85, 86 million barrels and stay there for tens of years, 10, 15 years. And the oil use will be rationed by demand, uh, by price, beg your pardon. And um, as time goes on, people accommodate to the higher price, they conserve, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, oil will slowly, slowly fade away. In, uh, by 2050, it's still an important component, but it's very, very expensive, and it's limited to uh, transportation and power generation for gas, but that's not it. So what's uh, happening on the demand side? Uh, the OECD is still falling, 1Q208, but non-OECD is still growing. So there is, the price isn't high enough to stop demand growth. Right, so the summary, uh, world produces 30 billion barrels of oil per annum, replaces less than 10. It's dominated by large fields. There are signs of decline in the biggest fields. Alternatives don't offset decline. Nationalism reduces access for IOCs, reduces efficiency anyway. Demand is still increasing. Price of oil goes up. Thank you very much. Jim, thanks very much for those remarks. Uh, we'll take two questions. Bill O'Reilly from Fox News has said, there has to be one person who sets the price of oil. Did this person increase the price today by 25% to coincide with the ASPO USA conference? Uh, the, the, um, the person that sets the price of oil is you. If you keep buying, it keeps going up. And um, so if you refuse, it'll flatten off. Will natural gas decline at a similar rate and time frame to oil? How much can natural gas mitigate the effects of a decline in, peak in, in oil production? Uh, I, I, broadly speaking, they have different use, uses, and you, you're hard put to replace uh, oil, liquids production by gas. So as a transportation fuel, you, you can, but, it, but it's a very limited substitute. So in my mind, um, gas can be used chemical feedstock, you know, space heating, uh, power generation. So they don't really overlap. It's, funnily enough, the reserves, the in thermal equivalents, reserves of oil and gas are about the same. And if you do the same sort of analysis, um, you, you, the peak gas is about, you know, five or ten years out after peak oil. Uh, and that's, that's not a very cheerful thought, but um, if you do the same sums, you get the same place. Uh, final question. This one's from Richard Brenner. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was wrong about heavier-than-air flight for centuries. Isn't it possible that Malthus and the Club of Rome predictions could still come true? They've just been delayed by cheap and abundant fossil fuels. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the uh, uh, drift of the question, um, but here's, here's a few things. 
the, peop the, the statement that the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones, that's the most vapid, senseless statement I've, I've, I've <laughs> ever, ever heard. Um, that's brain death. Um, but um, uh, I, I don't, so I mean, I can't see any magic uh, bullet. If, if by Malthus and so on they meant that ingenuity will, will come to the rescue, I, I don't think so. This, this stuff you burn. Um, and a, a little analogy I like to give is if, if your car is stuck at the bottom of a hill and you've run out of gas and you find, oh, I've still got some gas. You can go, put in your car, boom, boom, and drive up the hill. There is nothing else that can do that. And uh, we're, we're using it at uh, 86 million barrels a day for a mere $100. Thank you very much. <laughs>